Welcome to Sorter TV. I'm Vaishali Jain. We're excited to have Dr. Josh Davis join us today. Dr. Davis is an Ivy League professor and the author of the book, Two Awesome Hours, Science-Based Strategies to Harness Your Best Time and Get Your Most Important Work Done. And he's here to tell us more. Josh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell us a little bit about your, your background and, and your career and how you got to where you are today. For me, there's a, a theme that kind of runs through it all. It sounds like it goes all over the place at first, but I really love teaching, um, just the whole craft of it. Taking an idea, simplifying it, bringing it to someone, helping them see how they can use it and run with it. I have uh, taught in public schools. I've taught at uh, universities. I was a professor at Barnard College, part of Columbia, for a number of years. Executive education in the management consulting space. Um, so that, for me, that's the theme that runs through it. But the various things I've done, I've been an engineer, uh, you know, a teacher, I, you know, worked various different office jobs. Uh, but ultimately, what I've found is that there's a, just a tremendous wealth of information in the world of psychology research, neuroscience research, and uh, psychotherapy. So that's, uh, I've studied a lot as well, neuro-linguistic programming, which is a collection of psychotherapy techniques. Um, and uh, I, and these can really be brought to bear if you distill them down into the principles people can act on, the, the, where I think there's a tremendous amount of potential. So that has been the focus of, of my work professionally for a number of years now and also in the book. What did you actually get your degrees in? My undergraduate degree was in engineering, uh, mechanical engineering. My graduate degree, uh, doctorate in psychology, um, I studied with someone who, uh, Dr. Kevin Oxner, who coined the term, uh, along with Matt Lieberman, social cognitive neuroscience. So that is looking at the questions in social psychology, uh, such as, you know, how do people interact? How, how are our emotions affecting us in social contexts? How do we regulate them? And so on. But also looking at what's happening in the brain when we're doing that. Okay, so your book, Two Awesome Hours, tell us what inspired you to write the book. Well, what inspired me to write the book was that I and my wife and the people that I know, good people working hard, get home at the end of the day and just feeling awful about themselves. Like, it's never enough. Uh, there's always underwater, completely overwhelmed, no way to do it all, right? And that just didn't seem right to me. You know, it was almost a moral thing. It was almost like, that's not how human beings should be living. You know, that you're, you're working hard, your heart's in the right place, you're caring, and you just come home feeling bad about yourself and bad about what you've contributed because it's not enough. So I was, I was very motivated to explore different ways of understanding this. The, the core idea that was really, that I think made it possible then was, and to be honest, I don't remember how this particular connection came to be, but the core idea was that I noticed that there are times when we can be really productive, right? I mean, you can have a half hour, maybe a couple hours where you're just hitting it out of the park, right? You figured out exactly who needs to be on your team, how you're going to run this interview, how you're going to, you know, organize this new marketing plan, whatever it is, right? You're just nailing it. And it's great work. And it really is your best work. And it's going to last and have a lasting impact, right? And if you're anything like me, you can have two or three days in a row where you're worthless, you know, practically, right? And so the thing is, if there are times when we can really be that productive, right, there must be conditions for that. There must be some kind of psychological or physiological conditions that lead to that, that help set it up. And so, so then the question became, can we turn to the research? Can we find some kind of reliable ways of figuring out what sets up those conditions? Right, so that we can actually do that at will or as often as we need to or for the things that really matter. Getting into your book and obviously building off of what you just said, your first chapter you begin to speak about how, you know, whether we love our jobs or we don't, oftentimes we just kind of run on autopilot. You know, we go from task to task to task. Um, but this also has impacts on how we make decisions. Um, can you talk a little bit about the theories and the, the scientific reasons behind what, what is actually happening at that point? Yeah, well, so here's why I think it's so 
critical to understand just how much time we spend on autopilot. And by autopilot, I don't mean that we're not conscious of anything, that we're just robots. What I mean is that we're, we don't need to be fully conscious of all the things that we might have to get to. It, it, we can be operating relatively expertly, essentially. That uh, this, is, this is a general principle about how the brain works, that uh, we, as we learn, as we become experts, we find ways to do things mentally such that they require less mental effort. And one of, the, one of the important ways that we do that is to be able to hand off a lot of that processing to parts of the brain that are evolutionarily older. Um, they tend to be more towards the center of the brain, areas such as the basal ganglia for people who care about the names of these things. And these are areas where very well learned, I mean, it can be, it can be a quite expert thing that you've learned. You know, I can be in meeting mode where there's um, a lot that I've learned about how to listen to people, when to speak up, um, how to frame a meeting, that if I've done it many times, I don't need to be consciously thinking about all the different components of it, right? It's re I'm, I can be on autopilot, because I'm in that mode, right? And we have, you know, a classic one that everyone will have experienced is, you know, you're driving to work, right? And you get there and you can look up and just say, oh my God, how am I still alive, right? You know, like, you didn't have to consciously be thinking about every step of the way. And we do that to some degree uh, when we get involved in any kind of a task. And this is a good thing. I mean, this is, this is what expertise means, is that we get to the point where we don't have to be consciously thinking about every step. A great plumber can look at something and just quickly have a sense, this is going to need a replacement part, or this is something I can fix, and I have a hunch how. Right? So it's, that's the kind of thing that we rely on when I say autopilot. So, you know, we can think about, we can start to think about, uh, instead of, instead of, you know, how do I, how do I break out of autopilot? How do I understand when I'm on autopilot and when I'm not? So the, there's the classic advice, right, that you need to do what's important, not what's urgent. And I don't think there's anyone who would disagree with that. Uh, the thing is, the real challenge, I would say, is that it's actually not so hard to know what's important. If I asked you when you were on vacation what really matters for your career, you could tell me, I should be doing this and this and this, right? But you sit down in front of the computer on Monday morning and there's a million things you start just reacting to. The real challenge is in understanding when we have the mental capacity to really be able to take stock of all that's important and make a deliberate choice. That we actually, when we're on autopilot, we don't have as much capacity to do that. It's very difficult to just deliberately, willfully somehow break out of autopilot. What does break us out of autopilot, though, is when we come to a mental crossroads. There are even some researchers who argue that the whole point of consciousness is to make a decision when autopilot fails. <laughs> right? So, for example, I'm sitting there, I'm working on a paper, right? and my wife walks in and wants to talk about our plans for the weekend. I really genuinely want to do both. There is no autopilot that can handle both. I'm at a crossroads. I need to bring on new re mental resources that I haven't been using. They tend to involve parts of the brain that are in prefrontal cortex, parts that are evolutionarily newer, parts that uh, are vastly different, vastly larger in humans than in other species. And uh, they are critical for being able to deliberately, consciously think through all of the elements of something. So we have ways, There's, uh, it's been argued that a part of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex uh, works in, at, at times like an alarm system when we do come to a crossroads, a conflict, to wake up, if you will, or to bring online more of these prefrontal resources, making it possible. So we're actually in a different state. Uh, we're recruiting different neural resources when we come to that crossroads. Now that doesn't, most of the day is on autopilot, but at the end of a task, or maybe when you've just been interrupted, which we usually hate, but actually it can be a real gift if you capture it, right? Or if you just, you know, plan an interruption, you know, in your, in your calendar, you can put it. That, but when we come to one of those points, suddenly we're much more capable of stepping back and remembering what's important and making a deliberate choice about what to do. It might feel like you're wasting a lot of time because you're totally aware of all of the unproductivity that's going on and how uncomfortable it feels because you're aware of more things at that point. You just want to be productive. You want to get going. It could last for five minutes and feel like an eternity. You get started on autopilot on the wrong thing, 
You start checking email, you could be gone for an hour and a half. Time really gets wasted when we start on the wrong task. Time doesn't get wasted in those moments when we're feeling unproductive trying to figure out what to do. So we need to learn to capture those, recognize that those are, I call them decision points. Those are, those are rare, special moments in the day when we have the ability to think about what's important and make a choice to do it. That, understanding that interplay of how the brain works can really provide a, a tremendous resource, I think, in terms of being able to actually do what's important by the end of the day and not just what's urgent. Tell us what impacts this has on a person who's actually at work and mm -hmm. how is it that they can utilize a technique like this? So, um, well, one of the things that uh, I've tried to do that was very important to me across the whole book, actually, was to identify things that were not going to require extra work to do because for me that would be a non-starter, right? Something that's going to help me manage my time and my productivity that requires extra work is just Right, that's, that's not gonna work. Um, it's also critical, my wife is a doctor, uh, and, uh, and so she has a very <laughs> limited schedule. She, has, she works a lot more than I do, right? And so, so I wanted it to be effective for her as well, right? So really, I think that's an extreme case. So the ways that this can be applied in, let's say, a work context, and I think a few different examples of different types of jobs can help. So um, there is one where, let's say, a computer programmer, right? Now this is actually a type of work where it's very easy to get on autopilot, right? And you're programming and you keep having things that keep grabbing your attention and you're sort of in this loop, right? And so it can, hours can go by, right? And there can be some productivity there, certainly. But you can also easily spend a lot of time working on elements of the coding that's not important. So for that, for someone like that, where autopilot could actually run for four hours or even eight hours, right? For them to take advantage of it, they're going to need to build in some, once they understand just how important it is to help them really think about how to work on the important challenges, right, by the end of the day, is to build in some breaks where they're, they force themselves to stand up and step away for a few minutes until they can remember that. For someone else in more of a, a leadership managerial position, they're likely to be in meetings throughout the day. Every single time a meeting ends, they're at a crossroads. Suddenly, they typically need to quickly check their calendar. What's next? What do I, who do I owe? Oh, I have 15 minutes. I want to make use of it, right? That's the, the tempting thing. Or I have five minutes. Let me just quickly check email. If there's a very important email you know you're waiting for, of course, look for it, right? But the ability to say, wait a second, this is a rare moment in the day when I can step back and think about what's important. How do I want to get out of this day really succeeding, right? Taking a few minutes right at that point, when you have those, that psychological distance, those increased resources, so knowing that, planning for that, that is immediately when that meeting ends, you're going to take a moment and step back until you can remember what's important. Before you look at that calendar, before you look at that to-do list, before you think about making use of the time, I keep wanting to use air quotes for that, right, because I don't think of it as useful, right, uh, then you know, then engage in what's actually important. And you may decide, yeah, right now is a great time for me to check, just catch up on some emails. There's nothing important right after this. It's just a routine meeting, whatever, All right? And, and I'm already covered for, but probably a good pro pro proportion of the time, you're gonna, you're gonna recognize other things that are important. And, you know, and we could talk about, you know, what would a doctor do in that context? What would it, but I think when you start to get different types of work, it's some of them will lend themselves to, interruptions or having a crossroads periodically, in which case it's about learning to capture those, planning ahead to take advantage of them. And for others, uh, if autopilot is likely to go on, then it's about expecting that you're going to need to build in some of those breaks. So in this chapter, in your first chapter, you also talk about how mental functioning falls into two different categories, right? So one is self-conscious and deliberate, and the other one is automatic and non-conscious. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the differences between the two? Yeah, so um, the automatic non-conscious type of processing, that's something that um, it doesn't tend to fatigue very much, uh, that um, it works very much like a pattern recognizer. We take in lots of inputs without even knowing it. And, and it's how we're able to say walk down the street and you just glance across the street and say, that looks dangerous, I'm not going there. Right? We don't need to consciously think about why we get an instant feeling about it. right? that can get to be very sophisticated to the point 
for example, as I was referencing before, expertise, right? That's ultimately non-conscious processing. We've built up these pattern recognizers. This is like something I've seen before. I have an idea of the behaviors that follow. Um, the conscious deliberate processing, um, that is processing that is very limited. We can really only hold one thing in mind consciously at a time. Uh, it seems to be more effortful. And as a funny thing about mental effort, it's, it's not that we run out of the ability to do it. It just feels harder. Um, and it's analogous to physical effort, you know, that if you've just been working out, you know, you could keep working out for another hour if somebody was threatening you with a gun, right? You know, but it's, it's going to take a lot more motivation, right? And with mental effort, for some reason, we seem to do the same thing. Um, so these, these conscious, deliberate resources, they're critical for things like um, narrow focus, um, attention, uh, staying, thinking about your goals, uh, holding ideas in mind. So it's the deliberate, focused, conscious type of thinking that's critical for things like self-control, uh, controlling your emotions, controlling your behaviors, controlling your thoughts, or for making decisions. So in your book, you talk about implementation intentions. Tell us about this concept and the benefits these actions have. Implementation intentions are an idea from psychology research that are very powerful as compared to many other things in psych research. People form intentions all the time to complete various different types of goals. And if you think about uh, New Year's resolutions, right? You know, everybody knows that you're just like, this year I'm really gonna do it, right? I'm gonna lose 20 pounds, and then nobody does, right? They're famously things that just people don't actually do, right? So we form the best of intentions, but we don't actually follow through. Implementation intentions is the formation of intentions about how you're gonna implement the goal, not the intention to complete it, but the intention for how you're gonna implement it. And that kind of, that kind of thinking, uh, it involves getting very concrete about when and where you're actually gonna do the behavior. It can be helpful to actually visualize yourself in the context, the, you know, I get home, maybe I'd wanna stop eating dessert late at night, right? So I get home, I'm tired, I'm actually seeing myself in that context. And instead of just reaching for the ice cream, I uh, walk out of the kitchen and sit down on the couch and I think about how I'm gonna feel in the morning if I didn't have the ice cream. Right? I have this new behavior and I'm really specifically, very concretely imagining when and where I'm gonna do it. I've got this intention for how I'm gonna implement this goal. Right? And I can form many of these. And what's been shown in research is that when people do that, it dramatically increases the likelihood that they're gonna follow through. And the effect sizes are things that really are not seen very often in psychology research. You know, it can double the likelihood that somebody's gonna follow through on a home health exam, for example. It's really quite powerful. It's been shown to be relevant for new behaviors, for exercise, for controlling your emotions, for doing new things in a relationship context, for work-related goals. I mean, they're really quite powerful and the research seems to be uh, rather generalizable as well. Can you give us some examples of how you've seen this implemented um, in, a, in a work related setting? Um, help maybe some leaders that you've worked with have implemented something like this? Yeah, well so one of the reasons I introduced that research, I shared that research in the book is because I think it's a tremendous way to take advantage of decision points. That, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, yeah, I'm gonna do that, right? But Precisely because we're talking about doing something that's going to help us stay out of autopilot, autopilot takes over. You just fall into it, right? So if we form a plan ahead of time for exactly when and where and how we're going to do this thing that's going to lead us out of autopilot for a moment, right, or help us take advantage of the moment when it happens, then it's going to dramatically, should dramatically increase the likelihood that we'll actually take that decision point. And that can make all the difference. I mean, you could end up working half the time and get more of the important stuff done, right? It it's, can make a huge difference in what we do, but we have to actually take that decision point. And in the moment, you have lots of practice just going right into autopilot, following these urges, feeling unproductive and wanting to get started on something. So once you understand the importance of it and the rare kind of value of this brief moment in the day, 
you know, maybe you'll get on a good day 10 of these decision points, right? We're not talking about a lot of them. So to actually take them, so if I, if I can help someone see specifically, okay, you know, I hang up the phone, I'm at my desk, and really visualize specifically, well, I tend to do a bunch of calls in the morning, right? I mean, you know, as concrete as you can get, when I do that, then I'm going to take this new action. I'm literally going to push back from the desk and stand up and say to myself, this can be a decision point, right? So we get as concrete as that. And then that can really, can really, if the research holds, right, which it should, that can really dramatically increase the likelihood that you'll take that decision point. And then the more you get into the habit of it, then the more it's going to naturally just occur to you and become your automatic way of behaving. So your next chapter, you talk about mental f fatigue. And you talk about how, for, for many of us, every day is sort of a, a juggle and a battle of prioritizing different things that we need to do that can often cause mental fatigue. Can you explain exactly what mental fatigue is and some of the things that we could do to limit mental fatigue? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mental fatigue can think of as analogous to physical fatigue, that essentially it seems to get harder. It just feels harder to do certain types of thinking after we've been doing a lot of it, or if you haven't had enough sleep. Or, and I think we've all had these experiences, right? It's not like I'm saying something people haven't experienced. But what we do know are from research are some of the things that lead to that and some of the ways to alleviate it, right? And then that can be quite useful in terms of thinking about how you structure your day which can then have a big impact on whether you really do the important things well. Um, and I think that's ultimately what matters in terms of productivity. So the, uh, a couple of things that matter are one, when we're dealing with tasks that heavily, that heavily require the, uh, the executive functions, the ones that are uh, the conscious, deliberate kinds of functions we were talking about before that um, depend quite a bit on prefrontal cortex resources, ones that have to do with self-control in particular, so trying to not show that I'm upset in a meeting, right? Or I'm trying to uh, keep myself from eating that ice cream, right? You know, so various types of self-control that uh, it seems to get harder the more we use it as, in, as the day goes on, right? So, Curiously, we don't know exactly why. Researchers don't know why, and we know that it's possible to keep on doing it if you really have to, um, but we just, it gets harder. And there is a general principle about how the brain works that has been known for some time. Um, the, the idea, I believe it was Susan Fisk who coined the term that we are cognitive misers, uh, that we will conserve mental energy whenever we can. And one of the ways of doing that is to go on autopilot whenever we can. Right? And take advantage of, you know, uh, shortcuts, mental shortcuts, heuristics, you know, you've probably heard of things like the confirmation bias and other types of, right? So we, these things are ways to, to take mental shortcuts so that we don't have to wear ourselves out and we can then becoming an expert, essentially, so that we don't have to make use of this deliberate, mentally fatiguing type of thinking throughout the day and then we can have that when we really need it. So there's some famous research, for example, about how judges will make worse decisions as the day goes on. Parole decisions are very difficult to make, and it's been shown that people are less likely to get parole after lunch you know, than in the morning, even if it's the same case. Right? That shouldn't be the case, obviously. But so it's, it helps to reveal uh, just how much very thoughtful and well-meaning people behave differently when they fatigue themselves mentally. So mental fatigue can come from using a lot of self-control, essentially. Um, trying to really be deliberate and focused and control your behavior, your thoughts, your emotions, right? So that's one thing that can lead to it. Uh, another way of thinking about mental fatigue is essentially emotional exhaustion, right? So if we have been, if there's something that's very difficult for you to do and it makes you feel, you sort of, you dread doing it, right? So for, and it's really different for different people. For some people, it's that, that tough conversation with a coworker, right, or with a family member. For some people, it's actually doing the little detailed work on a spreadsheet that just drives them crazy, right? And they, you know, but so whatever it is for you, though, if there are tasks that really bring out strong emotions, it will, it will affect your thinking. It will 
you know, in various ways. Some of them are hard to predict, but it's likely that you will be behaving as though afterwards, if you've really been taxed emotionally, as though you are mentally fatigued. Things are going to be harder for you mentally. So the thing is, if you're just looking at your calendar in terms of the tasks you have to do, right? You've got a bunch of things. I've got this really important meeting, and I have some emails to get to, and I have a report to write, and blah, 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 right? Well, then you're just looking for hours to plug things in. But that would be fine if you got the same output every time you, you, know, you ran the machine. You know, if you're talking about a, a factory or a computer, you do get the same output. You should just keep that thing running, and it is about just slotting things in. Human beings aren't like that at all. We can be amazing for brief periods of time when we really show up with mental energy. And we can be, you know, we can, we can perform terribly and take forever to do something when we show up without it, right? So, so some of the things to do, and I'll just, I'll share one that's a common, just I, probably it will hurt because everyone has done this. Really important meeting, right? This could be a make or break thing for the next year of your career you get a chance to go present to the, you know, the higher ups in the company, right? Or, or somebody who might fund you or something like that, right? And you've got you know, an hour before the meeting and you spend it all making a whole bunch of little decisions about emails, you know, and who should I send this to and just trying to take care of some paperwork, getting stuff out of the way so that you won't have to think about it, right? So good intention. You've just worn out your self-control abilities and your decision-making abilities. You go into that meeting, you can't think clearly and you're actually not as good. You don't have the same mental resources. And you botch the meeting. That, that meeting was so much more important than anything else that you did before. All you have to do is reverse the order, and then you can show up with the mental energy for what matters, and then show up without the mental energy for the stuff that doesn't matter. You know? And I mean, I think it's even fine to sit and watch TV while you do some work, so long as it's work that you don't mind taking long, a long time to do and making errors on. You know, <laughs> but you know, but you can do. It's about so. So I encourage people to think about what really matters. Where do I want to show up? If there's something really so, and things to that can help to limit mental fatigue, right? So if there's something strongly emotional, I have a tough conversation. Let me look at what's right before and right after that. Am I trying to slot that in right before something very important to me, where I need to show up? If so, change the order. Move it to a different time of day. Move one of them, right? Am I trying to uh, do this? I know that I'm, I'm likely to not really have gotten good sleep, right? So am I trying to do this late in the day, that, that point? I'm unlikely to have good mental energy then. So actually thinking about how can I show up with the right mental energy for the stuff that's important? Start there, and then you can look at especially what you're doing in the half hour, hour right before it. But you can also look at well, maybe I should do that in the morning because I know that I'm better in the morning, for example, right? So these are some of the, some of the things that we can really focus on that I think can make a big difference. And it's just as, as simple as, as starting with what matters and just adjusting the order of some things in the day. So then tell us what are some of the consequences of making too many decisions? There's a, I think this is unexpected for a lot of people that uh, when we make a lot of decisions, it becomes harder to make other decisions, right? And we might think, well, decisions, that's just a mental thing. Why would that matter? And this is part of that idea of mental fatigue. So decision-making seems to tap into some of the same resources that we need for self-control. Uh, every time you make a decision, you're deciding not to do other things in favor of this one thing that may be why. And one of the things that's really important to know about this phenomenon is that it doesn't really seem to matter whether these are big, important life decisions or small decisions. We're still, make, we're still tapping into those resources and we seem to get fatigued as time goes on and just want to use them less as we've worn them out, right? And so then we're less likely to, to really use them without a lot of effort. So I like to pick on email just because it's a common thing we've all experienced. It's not that email is an evil thing, but I just want to you know, use that as, an, as a common example. Every email uh, requires a lot of decisions. It's, you know, have I um, included the right people? Have I said something offensive? How will this come across? You know, do I think that this is, is going to come across on paper without the emotions there? Do I need an emoticon? Would that look silly to have an emoticon, right? So there's a number of very little decisions, but they actually matter because 
we're dealing with social interactions, right? And we care quite a bit. Human beings are, are designed to care quite deeply about how other people think of them. And it is critical, as anyone knows in business, to care about that, right? So it does have important consequences. It's not just about information sharing. And so these decisions, you know, we're making a ton of these decisions every time we're doing it. So, you know, if you spend a half hour doing that, you've made a lot of decisions, even if none of them were really that important. None of them pertain to the really important thing that you needed to do today. You know, maybe some of them did, maybe some of them didn't. But you've just, you know, so we make decisions, a lot of decisions throughout the day, even when we're not aware that we're making so many decisions. One thing that uh, some presidents have done, for example, is to uh, have other people decide what clothes they're going to wear. You know, or, and what some people do is to make decisions about um, certain components of their day the night before so that they won't be taxing those resources in the morning. Right? And these, based on the research, this really should make a difference, these kinds of things. Tell us a little bit about how we can use negative emotions like sadness and anger to our benefit. So this, is, this one's fun for me, at least, because it's very counterintuitive. We tend to think of negative emotions as a bad thing, as a thing to just get rid of, right? to try to avoid. And I know that there's more and more consciousness of the idea that you know, we should be mindful and just sit with any emotion. This is actually something different that I'm about to share as well, which is that every emotion has some adaptive value. There's a, there's a function for it, there's a reason we have these. Um, who knows whether it was evolutionarily why it came to be or whether it has just now is how the function that it provides for us. But regardless, they provide functions for us. And some of the functions that have been shown in research for negative emotions like sadness and anxiety are that they help us narrow our focus. It helps us focus specifically on one important thing. And that can be quite valuable sometimes. You know, it's like, why do I feel anxious about this? Well, it's actually a way for you to both get energized and to narrow your focus. And you've probably learned that over time, even if you weren't consciously aware of it. And so this is a strategy that you use. There's one also which is unusual among the negative emotions. Because negative emotions are usually about moving away from something. But anger is a negative emotion that has to do with moving towards something. So anger we can use strategically sometimes. So if you're someone who doesn't tend to get angry a lot, right, then let's say you run a shop and you know, you know that you should be increasing your prices or you're a consultant you know, or a coach or who knows. You know you should be increasing your prices, but you feel bad about it. You're like, well, I want to give people a good value and things like that. At the same time, I can't afford to be doing it on my own dime because you know, I have to increase periodically. And so, you know, a little bit of, of anger, you know, letting yourself get in touch with some anger can be a way for you to go ahead and feel justified and take that action, right? So, you know, I, in a context like that, especially where there isn't another person directly who you're interacting with, I think it's a very useful thing to do. It's an adaptive thing to do. And you see it in uh, sports, right? You know, you've got someone feeling really down or sad and the coach helps them shift that negativity into anger and go back out on the field, right? Because, because anger helps us approach something in a very strong way. That's interesting. I guess the balance would be to not make any rash decisions based on the anger or the sadness that you feel, right? As something that's reactionary. Right, that's right. And if you've got somebody who tends to get angry a lot, then uh, one way of saying it is that they're already quite skilled in that and that they might want to intentionally focus their energy on being less angry. <laughs> right. In your book, you also talk about when people become overly emotional and mm -hmm. some of the impacts that has on us and the way we feel. And you also talk about some ways we can sort of refresh ourselves when we do become overly emotional. Can you talk about some of the ways that we can do that? Yeah. So, you know, we can become, we all can do this as well. You know, I know some people really like to think that they're, you know, they leave their emotions at the door when they come to work. But the thing is our emotions are critical parts of how we know that we value something and uh, guiding us in how we should interact with someone. We all to some degree bring our emotions with us everywhere we go. And there's good value to that. If we didn't, you know, we'd, we wouldn't be able to be functioning humans. Um, so, so when people are saying they leave their emotions at the door, what it probably means is they have good ways of stepping back and regulating and, and 
you know, if the emotion is too strong, that they're helping to, to decrease it to a point where they can be thinking clearly again. Uh, and so a few things that, that we can do is, is one, you can recognize some of the things that are likely to do that to you. And so for someone who, who fears public speaking, then you should expect that if you're going to be presenting, you're going to have some very strong emotions, probably fear-related emotions, right? And if you're someone who, you know, or if you have a difficult relationship with someone and you have to have a tough conversation or a performance conversation, right? And then you should expect that that's going to have a strong emotional impact on you and on them. Right? And you know, something that you've been procrastinating right? and then you need to get to, there's probably going to be some strong anxiety around it. Right? So, so when we know, so y you can plan ahead a little bit because you kind of, it's, they, they seem like, oh, these emotions just happened to me, but actually they're pretty regular. They tend to come in response to certain triggers. And in the future, if those situations come up, you're probably going to feel a, the same emotion. Right? So, so we can plan ahead and when you do plan ahead, then you can have just a few things in your toolbox. There's a wealth of research on how to regulate your emotions, but a few easy things uh, that should be relevant for any emotion are one, um, actually breathing. Right? So breathing, one of the, one of the strong, strong predictors of heart rate is breathing rate. Right? So if you want to be able to change your physiology directly, you can change your breathing and that will have a very quick effect on your heart rate and then subsequently on other parts of your physiology, right? So if you slow down your breathing, you slow down your heart rate. If you increase, you increase it. So, you know, I think there's common sense, right? Count to 10 and breathe, right? Well, that's real, right? So uh, another thing that we can do is that typically when the emotions are too strong, they tend to be negative emotions. Um, and uh, uh, it is possible to actually create an emotional state. Um, and now many people think of emotions as something that just happened to them, but they always happen in response to a situation. And usually it's in response to how you mentally think of a situation, actually not the situation itself. So we do have a lot of flexibility in what we do. And one thing that uh, is possible is to, you know, actually find some way to laugh, right? To, to you know, put on some comedy, to talk to a friend, to uh, sometimes to laugh at yourself, uh, you know, or some other positive thing that it is possible to just think about that positive scenario and, and, and then you will start to experience some of that. You can also do things physically, there's the breathing, but you can, you know, stand up straight and, you know, and uh, this goes back to William James in the 1890s, you know, really describing this. this is something we've known for a long time that you can do this. So some of those physical things, actually imagining something positive or having a good laugh. And then also, uh, believe it or not, just taking a, a nap for 10, 20 minutes. A long nap takes longer to recover from, actually. Uh, so 10 to 20 minute nap, great benefits. You recover immediately so you can start benefiting from it immediately. It really helps you reset in terms of mental fatigue and just kind of like, emotions are physiological. And so they don't turn off in an instant. So you need, you know, some minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes for things to kind of shift, to fade little by little. And if you're not continually reigniting the emotion by the way that you're thinking, it will fade. So people often struggle with sustaining their attention on a critical task. Can you tell us the science behind why this happens? So, yes, this is the experience. You're sitting, you're trying to work, you, you've got something important to focus on and you just can't seem to focus, right? You just keep on you know, getting distracted by this and that. What's happening is that your brain is a functioning brain. <laughs> right? That if that didn't happen, there would be a problem because our attention systems are not designed to stay focused. If that was the case, our ancestors just would have been eaten by tigers, right? Our attention systems are designed to pick up on what's changing, to orient to new things, to alert us to what we need to quickly shift our attention to, right? So we, we don't have, we don't have uh, a mechanism really for just unlimited sustained focus. When we continue to stay focused, let's say on a movie or something like that, it's because there are continually, again and again, new interesting things to keep shifting our focus onto, right? And they're designed that way very thoughtfully. A great deal of effort goes into making that possible. And now computers and smartphones, they keep on being designed that way where we've got pop-ups and things that can make it very easy to, 
you know, grab your attention, and then you can get, you know, started on autopilot again, right? So you get into it, and, and so it, it keeps on, keeps you shifting more frequently than you even need to, like even ahead of what your attention systems are demanding. But so you try to sit and focus, and you shift. Now what happens at that point is the typical thing that most people would do is, well, the first thing most people do is just yell at themselves and try to berate themselves and say, you've got to stay focused, right? And of course, that doesn't do anything. Uh, so the... The, the next thing is to say, well, let me, okay, let me take a break, right? So I'm going to do something, you know, maybe that's just a little bit fun for me. I'm going to read the tabloids or I'm going to read the sports or maybe I'll do something useful like checking email or who knows, right? So the thing is all of those tasks, though, involve tracking new information. So there's one problem with those tasks, which is that you're likely to get onto autopilot and lose who knows how much time. All right, it could be a, really a tremendous waste. Perhaps the bigger problem, though, is that if you do that and you shift to something that feels fun or useful, you're still processing a lot of information. So you actually block something really critical. You block mind wandering. And I know that that might sound odd to say that that's the whole point, right? I'm trying to not mind wander. <laughs> and you're saying that it's a problem if I block mind wandering. Mind wandering is an opportunity for the brain to do some very important processing. There's a lot of things happening unconsciously. In the non-conscious brain, there's all these bits of information you've taken in, patterns, new connections, right? And we need to find ways to integrate that with what we already know and, and take advantage of it. And as long as we're continuing to process new information, we don't do that. So when I say mind wandering, I mean really just drifting, right? Like when you're staring out the window, it's actually a little bit different from mindfulness, which is also useful for many things, but, but uh, mindfulness is about trying to bring your attention back to something. Mind wandering, you're really just wherever it goes, right? You're just drifting. And uh, what's been shown in research on mind wandering, there is research on mind wandering, um, is that uh, you get quite a number of things that happen that are quite valuable that can happen in a relatively short amount of time. And I, have, I know of almost nothing else that has these, so many of these benefits all in one, one place. So for example, there, uh, there are two different parts of the, um, of the prefrontal cortex, the more lateral part that's, that we call the executive network. So for deliberate focus on goals and things like that. And then the, uh, the, me the medial part, the midline, that is critical for thinking about ourselves and others and social context, social relationships, they're anti-correlated. So when one's active, the other is, is, is less active, vice versa, except when we're mind wandering. Then they're active together and they start to integrate. So it's one of the few times we're integrating our goals and our social needs right, and that context, which is tremendous for being able to be successful. When we mind wander, we tend to think about uh, planning for the future, that's where minds tend to go. And you might say, well, I ruminate, you know, I feel anxious when I wander. Anxiety is about the future. Right? So, you know, our minds tend to do that. We tend to become more creative. If you give someone a creative challenge and then let them mind wander, they actually perform better in terms of other people rating it as more creative than if they had just worked straight through on it. Right? So, they, so the mind wandering increases the creativity because there's a number of connections that can occur that would be blocked otherwise. Right? So uh, it also helps people find ways to regulate themselves so that they can hold out for the long-term benefit. That's been shown as well. So there's a, quite a range of things that are very useful for being able to do high quality work. Another thing that I love about mind wandering is that let's say you, you stand up and you do go to the window, right? Which is a great way to do it. Anything where you're looking at a device, tracking information, blocks mind wandering, right? But if you just go to the window and you stare out and you're just noticing what's happening, or you can put on music and just notice the music, right? Then that helps to facilitate this kind of drifting, this mind wandering. And the thing is, after a few minutes of staring out the window, it gets boring, right? So you have this automatic built-in way to stop. And then you kind of look around, you come back to your work. Not only do you come back probably much faster than you would have otherwise, but when you come back, you're refreshed, and you're able then to focus and do something really valuable, right? So it is a dramatic shift. So this is why I say stop fighting distractions. I don't mean give in to your distractions. What I mean is the fighting part. Stop doing the fighting. When your mind wants to wander, let it. So your book also touches on things like 
strategically eating and drinking and exercising as a way of um, improving your, your mental productivity and the way you feel. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you explore this in your book? Yeah, so I'll give one example that I think helps to bring it home. Exercise is something we typically think about as, you know, well, if I exercise, maybe I'll live longer, or I'll probably lose weight, I'll look better, I'll be healthier, but this is all long-term stuff, right? That kind of theory about exercising, which is true, will lead you to do things like working out for an hour and a half twice a week at 8 p.m., right? So it's not that it's bad to do those things, but you would only get those long-term benefits from it. There's a different side to exercise, and there is a tremendous amount of research on this. It's just quite reliable at this point. The acute effects of exercise. So within the next few hours, how's it going to affect me for the morning or for the whole day, right? For my work day, or if I work out in the middle of the day for the afternoon. So the way I like to say it is this. Effectively, there is a reset button. If you run out of mental energy, if you're feeling bad, if you've you know, you know, you, or maybe you're just not uh, a morning person, or maybe you're just not an, e uh, an after afternoon person, right? There is a reset button, and that's roughly 20 minutes of moderate exercise, not killing it, not overdoing it. That that actually has uh, negative consequences, ultimately, not negative, but diminishing returns, at least, uh, and sometimes less than what you would get compared to moderate exercise. Moderate exercise would be working up a little bit of a sweat, you know, not enough where, you know, you're just completely, completely overworked. But, uh, you know, 45 minutes of a brisk walk, 10 minutes up and down the stairs, if you don't do stairs that often, right, or 20 minutes of a jog, that will very reliably reduce anxiety and allow you to focus. Essentially letting you be present and let the things go that don't matter, right, to be able to think clearly. So I make it actually strategically a part of my preparation whenever I'm doing an important presentation, for example, right? is that I make sure I exercise. If I'm traveling and there's no other way to do it, I'll jog in place in my hotel room for 15 minutes because I know how important that is for me to be able to show up and really be at my best. So we can start using it that way. And one thing that happens as a consequence is that you're probably more likely to exercise every day if you're using it as a tool for the day, right? You might exercise for a shorter amount of time, but you're probably gonna be doing it more frequently. And the same goes with what you're eating and how much caffeine you, you drink. Exactly, we can use food and caffeine these ways. You know, caffeine does seem to really help people focus and give that good feeling, but there's some interesting things to know is that your dose matters and everyone's different. So if you go beyond your dose, you're not getting more benefits. It's actually going to get in the way. Um, and if you want the good feeling to last with caffeine, actually have it with some fats. Put some cream in that coffee or some of that coconut oil or something, right? That that actually is likely to make those effects last longer. Um, and with food, it's really all about stable blood sugar. Um, so, you know, eating smaller meals. If you really need to, you know, be present and think clearly throughout the day, try taking your lunch and just breaking it into two parts and eating it a couple hours apart, right? Or, you know, have things that are not just bread, right? <laughs> have things that, the things that will lead to stable blood sugar should help you actually really maintain good performance. Tell us about the importance of your environment and your workspace to maximizing your productivity. Mm -hmm. Well, so one of the things is the importance of a, of a clean desk, actually, that probably many people have had the experience that they know they like it better, but actually the research is hopefully compelling enough that it will really lead you to make a difference. That uh, I like to think of it this way. Did you ever booby trap a room as a kid? You know, you put like a, a cup of water on top of the door, right? You know, you've got all these little traps in there, right? That we can think of a messy desk as a booby trapped office. Um, but it's booby trap for your distractions. So the, if you think about the things that get left on a desk, they tend to be things that were difficult or where there's some social obligation or where you, know, you knew it was gonna take a lot of time. Right? It's the stuff that exactly the wrong stuff f to be within your visual field when you've decided to sit down and really work on something important. Because right? if you've already decided what's important to work on, then it's not that other stuff. Right? 
So, but that stuff is exquisitely designed to grab your attention. Other things that are well designed to grab your attention are the little pop-ups on a screen, you know, that there, you know, people have worked hard to make them be able to grab your attention easily. Uh, and another one is the sound of voices. So other people, so open plan offices are really quite a challenge for high quality concentrated work. Um, they can be good for team building and other things like that, but for doing really thoughtful work, they are are pretty bad, uh, to be honest, right? So uh, it's worth it to, if you're really gonna go and sit down and get some good work done and your desk is a mess, it's worth it to either go work somewhere else for that work session or to just take everything, no matter what it is, and just put it in a pile and move it out of your visual field because then you won't be distracted about it while you're working. I'm not saying don't get to it, I'm not saying throw it away, whatever, you know, however you wanna handle that, but if you've decided that it's in time to do something important, Clear that desk or go sit somewhere without it because it really will make a difference. The other two things about the environment that are useful to know are light and noise. The story on noise is pretty straightforward. You know, I'm someone who really enjoys sitting in coffee shops, so this is sad for me to hear, but essentially we perform worse. It will take you longer and you will do worse work. You'll make more errors if there's noise. And it doesn't matter if it's speech or white noise or music or whatever. Speech is the worst. Human speech is extremely hard for people to tune out uh, for good reason. You know, we have lots of reasons for picking up on what other people are doing. It helps us survive, <laughs> you know, navigate the social world. But the downside is that it's very hard to tune out. Uh, but they all will have a decrement in performance. There's a few, a few qualifications to that. They're very subtle and they're almost never relevant to the kind of knowledge work most people are doing these days. But uh, the if you're doing something, the visual arts kind of creative work, right? then a little bit of noise, if it creates the psychological experience of being free from constraints, then can help with creativity. But too much noise actually will interfere with that anyway, if it's really loud. And uh, um, you know, the same can be said of lighting, that some darkness can create that freedom from constraints, and if it does that, it can help with creativity. Um, you've got also some kids who are really far on the spectrum of having difficulty paying attention who can do better with some white noise. But for most people, if you're in any kind of uh, meaningful work as an adult, you're not in that category. Right? So you're, you're at a point in your life uh, where your concentration is such that you probably are going to do worse with noise. So you know, if you have something important to do, then find a quiet space, put on some noise canceling headphones, uh, which also signals to other people, don't bother me, right? So, you know, you don't do it all the time. There's plenty of things that we can do where it is okay if it takes a long time and you make errors, right? I mean, don't tell the boss, but <laughs> like, we all know that that's okay, but there's some things that really matter. And the last thing I'll say on that is light. There is research showing that uh, bright lighting and natural light, um, if you get some good light from the windows, does help people concentrate does make it easier to um, access the executive functions, so focused attention, um, deliberate decision making, that, those kinds of things. Uh, um, things like mental rotation have been shown as well, that people can take an object and rotate it in their minds more effectively with high quality light. So brighter lights as well as lights on the cool end of the spectrum, because that, that includes some of the light that you might see in a clear blue sky, that kind of light. I like you know, yellowish lights, they feel good emotionally, but I do know that if I really need to concentrate and I'm having a challenge, that going by a window or getting some of that cool light can help me, right? You can take advantage of that. So that's probably a more subtle one, but it, uh, it does, it has been shown to make a difference. So we want to talk a little bit about public speaking. We know that you actually teach a class on public speaking. So tell us some ways that leaders can actually help relieve their fears around public speaking. So it's also something that I have been teaching for a number of years and, uh, and I love thinking about the craft of it. Um, I would say that the most important thing to do is to think about the message that you have, the important message that you have because you wouldn't be speaking to the group you're speaking to unless you had something meaningful to share that is actually of value to them. And if you can think about what that important message is and think about how you can communicate it and think about, you know, do they have it yet? That in itself is a way to be 
uh, mentally present, right? And to really be able to succeed, right? And what happens is many of the fears melt away because the fears have to do with what's happening if you're not focused on that. You know, if you're just standing up there thinking that people are evaluating you, right? And I mean, there's any number of fears associated with it. But so that's, I think, a tremendous piece. There's many things that you can do, but that's, that's one thing that I can offer. Okay. What are some things that you can do to identify your strengths and weaknesses as a public speaker? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, I think what's core for being able to really communicate effectively, right? Is that you, um, and this is also similar to the question of, uh, you know, how do I find a voice um, in public speaking? Every person has their own voice as a human being, right? If you meet them in a casual situation, right, they have a personality. They have their own voice. They, they are a unique person. When people get in front of an audience, sometimes they think that they need to try to follow a certain script or do things in a certain way. When you really stay focused on your message, right, which I know is the same piece I was saying before, but when you really stay focused on your message and whether the other person understands your message or whether the audience understands your message, then people start to speak in ways that are natural for them. Right? And so then you and your natural voice and your unique voice starts to come out, when that happens, you play to your strengths automatically, right? And uh, yeah, over time, if once you're playing to your strengths, if you say, yeah, you know what? I don't really take advantage of, of the performance aspect of it, right? Then you're in a space where you can really play with the performance aspect of it. But if you just try to jump to playing with the performance aspect of it or fixing things that, you know, that you feel are broken and you don't have that core to build on, it's very difficult, right? So starting there, you can actually get to a place of a unique voice. You can start to build that actually relatively quickly if you're focused on your message, right? And then it becomes a, almost a game, like an additive piece, a fun thing. It's like, what, what else do I want to play with, right? And that can be a way to quickly really start to build uh, it's a much less threatening way. It, it's a, when, when people enjoy doing something, they put more energy into it and they do it quickly, right? And so I think that's a great way to go about it. So introductions and endings can make or break a presentation. So can you provide some tips on how to introduce and end mm -hmm. a presentation effectively? Yeah. So what I would say is this know what it is that you want to get out of the presentation yourself, right? And also be aware of what you want your audience to get out of the presentation. And it's even fair game to have a dialogue with your audience about that, right? There are many contexts where there's a lot more freedom than people realize. Um, but if you know what that is, then a few things happen. One is, first of all, you can take a look at whether it's unrealistic. You know, sometimes I go in and I'm aware, hey, I really want people to like me. Well, I don't have any control over that and I don't know who's particularly going to be there. Maybe they won't like my sense of humor. You know, it's just sort of, that's not within my control. That's not a good thing for me to want. So one thing is that I can be, I can notice that and say, okay, what else do I want out of this, right? Well, I want an opportunity to uh, practice my material. I want uh, people in this particular industry to know about these ideas. I want to explore ways to get people to actually walk away with something actionable, right? So there's, there are things that I can say, yeah, I think I can accomplish that. Maybe it's a stretch. It's not completely in my control, but I think I can accomplish that. So if I can think about like, what do I really want to get out of this? What do I want them to get out of this? Then my introduction and my ending will flow naturally from that, right? So one of the things that you'll hear from me as a general theme is that it's not about the tricks, it's not about the gimmicks, it's about knowing what you're about and you know your your purpose there, right? And that letting the other pieces flow from that, right? How can we find our own unique public speaking style and develop our own unique voice? It starts with 
It starts with focusing on your message. It starts with really knowing that you have something important, showing up and caring about wanting to communicate that, and really focusing on your audience to see if they understand your message right, and what you can do to help them understand that. When that happens, it takes people out of their heads and gets them, allows them to be present, right? which is something that you know, a lot of people say, how can I just be present? Well, it's not by just deciding to be present. It's by doing something where you find yourself being present. And when you really care about the message and you're focused on that, then you're present. Right? And so when you do that, um, people have well-learned ways throughout their life of experience to communicate messages. Some people like to do it in a joking way. Some people you know, really connect emotionally. Some people like to lean in a lot, right? Some people, you know, they like to be more uh, logical about it, right? It, but you will start to tap into your best ways of doing that, which will be a lifetime accumulation of your own personal crafting of who you are, right? That can happen when you're present with your message, right? It's most likely to happen when you're present with your message because then you're just using your best resources to communicate and your best resources are things that are going to be unique that you've built up. Once you're doing that, then you're freed up to play with other things and say, you know what, I love the way that Martin Luther King let his voice soar. Right? And I loved how he used open poetry and these phrases where that left you wondering about what does that really mean? I have a beautiful image and feeling, and it can mean so many things, right? I want to play with that. Right? And so, so then I can think about, while I'm thinking about what my message is, I can think about, well, what would that be like? And here, what I would say is, it's really valuable to have a safe space where you can have a group of people who are also interested in playing around with these things. And discover, the key thing is discover what happens, learning about the options that you have in this safe space. Right? Discovering what does it really feel like if I let my voice soar. And oftentimes, to be quite honest, it's from the audience perspective, it's like, oh, that was nice. I like that, right? It's not this bizarre thing that you think that, you know, that in fact the audience, like you looked like a different person. It was a different person up there to me, but it was not weird, right? It was just great, right? And so, you know, these, and sometimes people are like, oh my God, that felt great. And other times people are like, that felt really awkward, but then the audience has a different experience, right? So discovering the options that you have then is a great way to start building on that. Now, any tips that you have for dealing with a difficult audience? I like to assume that my audience is coming to me with the best of intentions. And it may not be true, but I found it to be very useful. That, so somebody might be giving me a hard time and saying, but isn't this wrong, right? Or why are you saying that? Right? It might sound hostile. And the, the other people in the audience might be like, oh my god, who is this guy? Right? Why is he doing that? If I think about, all right, look, this person is motivated to be asking these questions because he really wants to understand. He really wants to see, is there anything of value for him here, right? Is there any reason for him to change his mind? So if I take that at face value and I think about how can I take what he's said and make it into something that's going to usefully move our whole conversation together that brings him along and the whole audience along, which makes sense if he had good intentions, right? It's then going to help me create a situation where everyone feels free to speak up, right? And where uh, the audience is going to still, the other audience members are actually still going to want to engage in him because I've helped him to look like a useful member of the audience. Right? If I start splintering the audience and I just try to say, like, and I try to like, prove that he's wrong or something, then I'm creating a lot of distraction and I'm losing my audience. So instead, if I start with that and I think, well, here's why I see that there's a lot of value, right? And maybe I would have said it six times already but I obviously didn't communicate it yet well enough to him. Right? So I try a different way of saying, well, here's why I think it's important to talk about this, right? if that was his question. Right? And then I'll really inquire, does that address it for you? Or what else, you know? And, and you know, I'm not going to take the whole time on it, but enough that I made it clear that I you know, want to use that as, that that was a useful thing to say 
you know, that I'm really showing that. I'm not just saying, thank you, that was an interesting question or that was useful. Instead, I'm showing that by actually making it that way. If you take that approach to any difficult audience, I really think that you can turn it into a, a positive and, and actually end up with a better result um, than if they hadn't said anything. Any do's and don'ts of public speaking that you could share with us? I think, uh, you know, one common thing is uh, people like to, um, you know, like to, maybe it's the wrong word, but they'll, they'll often last minute try to flip through and remember specific points and worry about, I've got to get to all my messages and, all, you know, all the content, right? And worry about getting through all the slides. So if you're at that point, right beforehand and you're still not sure about those things, like you're already past the point of whether you should be worrying about that because the timing you could have figured out ahead of time, right? So I would say don't use your time right before a presentation for that, but also the main reason is because you, you, I encourage you to use your time right before a presentation for something very different that can help you flow with whatever comes help you be more capable of getting to all of your material if you really want to or choosing not to get to all of your material which is to take a moment right before and ask yourself what state do you want to be in right and uh, so one thing I do is I it, it can just be 30 seconds oftentimes it's more usually you know 15 minutes before on my way in <laughs> you know I'm thinking about three things what do I want to get out of this what do I want them to get out of this? And what state do I want to be in as I'm doing this? What experience do I want to be having? Because we do actually have some control over that. If you say, you know, well, I want to be playful. I want to be comfortable. I want to be serious, right? I can take a moment and connect with that and say, yeah, this is, you know, I want to, you know, I want to be thoughtful here with them. I want to really listen. You know, whatever it is, right? What state do I want to be in? Take a moment and connect with that. And if you're focused on your message and what you want to get out of it and what you want them to get out of it and you're coming in with that state, you're going to be able to communicate things that really matter, enough of what really matters, right? And it's also going to free you up to be able to think a little bit about the timing. If you're saying, oh, I want to move a little bit quicker, right? Because you've got the big picture in place. You know what you're about, right? And, uh, and you won't be as free to do that. So those are the do's. Josh, this was really great. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on Sarder TV.